What is going on, everyone? It is Thursday, November 11th, 2021, and I am your host, Mark Real Jr., and this is State of the Family Courts. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, we originally did have a guest scheduled, but uh, being a lawyer sometimes can, in fact, get in the way, so we had a little emergency hearing that had to be dealt with, so we, we decided to jump in. It is Veterans Day. Uh, to do a little bit of a, a Veterans Day special. Uh, so number one, first of all, shout out to all of the veterans, all of the individuals that have served our country, uh, past and present. Uh, special shout out to our executive director, Casey Sowers, for his service, everything he did in the military, uh, and everything he's still doing today, uh, fighting for uh, father's rights as our executive director. So, uh, Casey, thank you to that for that, and uh, also uh, all, all the other men and women that are watching tonight that have served our country. So, um, originally we were going to base conversation around child support, uh, but uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we call it a little bit of an audible, and I thought it was um, a. A good segue, two of my favorite books uh, happen to be written by military men. Uh, one, Make Your Bed by uh, Admiral um, sorry, Admiral William McRaven. I, I don't know if anybody, he's got two books out now, uh, Hero Code and Make Your Bed. And then also David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. And I think there are a couple of lessons in these books that... All dads should hear, all dads should understand. Uh, and I think mindset-wise and mentality-wise, I think uh, can, can really help us. So uh, number one, this is probably the most recommended book. I, I This is probably the most commonly recommended book. You see my bookshelf, huge reader. This is one of my favorite two or three books. It's all of about 125 pages. Uh, so you can sit down and, and read it in, in a little, about an hour. So uh, probably the most profound chapter to me talks about being a sugar cookie. And now you're probably thinking, Mark, you're crazy. What does being a sugar cookie have to do with mindset, mentality, getting through things? So in the Marines going through buds, uh, they're, they're out there in the water. They're about 60, 70 miles south of me in San Diego. And one of the punishments that... Uh, General or Admiral McRaven talks about is uh, the instructors telling you to go make a sugar cookie. And what that may, means is you had to run out into the surf, uh, Pacific Ocean, not warm. And then once you get wet, you came up on the beach and you had to roll around and cover yourself in sand. And you were covered in sand from head to toe in every crack or crevice for the remainder of the day. But the part about being a sugar cookie and the stories they tell, so you would make sure your room was spotless, your bed was perfectly made. And then the instructor would look at you and knock a pillow off the bed and say, oops, you gotta go make a sugar cookie now. Or you would do something perfect and they would change the rules after the fact so you missed your time, you missed your mark. Oh, go, go make a sugar cookie. And I think the, the, the part about it that really gets to me is, so um, it, this was an instructor talking to um, Admiral McRaven, Mr. Mack, do you have any idea why you are a sugar cookie this morning? Martin said in a very calm, questioning manner. No, Instructor Martin, I dutifully responded. Because, Mr. Mack, life isn't fair, and the sooner you learn that, the better off you will be. And so you think about how that ties back into family court. We see it daily uh, where things don't seem to be fair. Uh, things don't work out the way we want them to work out. And things get drug out. Continuances occur. Decisions get made by judges, evaluators, therapists, guardians ad litem that don't make any sense. And one of the most common things I hear from my clients is that's not fair. Well, if you think about the concept of, of being a sugar cookie, 
Uh, that, that would kind of be the family court version of, of what occurs on a daily basis. And it happens to both men and women. And so if you can come from a place of realizing that life isn't fair and everything's not going to work out perfectly, and you're most likely going to be put in some uncomfortable situations, you are going to put yourself in a situation which you're not going to react out of emotion. You're not going to make the mistakes out of anger. And so you, you're you going to put yourself in a, in a better spot and you're going to remove a lot of a lot of stress that comes with going through the family court process by just simply understanding that, hey, life isn't fair. And despite the work we're doing and everything we all the balls that we have rolling and the, the things that are going to, that have happened in 2021 in terms of legislation and court cases and the things that are going to happen in the very near future, uh, that's not going to prevent unfair things from occurring. But we as the individuals who go through those things with our mindset and our mentality can better navigate through those processes. So um, I, I thought that was that was something given the uh, the Marines tie in it being Veterans Day. Uh, that that was something I wanted to share. I'd highly recommend both those books, uh, Make Your Bed by Admiral uh, William McRaven and Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Um, I think those those are two books that, that any dad going through family court uh, would, would be well worth it for them to pick those books up. So uh, we'll, we'll hop in now. First thing I have is we do have an update on, we have some special features on our YouTube page now. So we've, we've been changing things. We've been, uh, I know we've been emphasizing getting people over onto our YouTube page. And uh, now we actually have the ability, you can become a member of the Father's Rights Movement's YouTube page. And that's going to come with some special features. Uh, it's a nominal amount. It's $1.99 a month to become a member on our YouTube page. And with that, you're going to get, you're, there's going to be loyalty badges, rewards, uh, for engaging with our content. It's not just going to be my show um, on Unfaltering Fathers on Tuesdays, live with Rosa on Wednesdays. You'll also have those special features and accesses during those shows. Um, you're going to have access to, um, I know Casey is working on some special emojis in the chat, and uh, you're going to get uh, early access to a lot of the things that are coming down the pipeline for the Father's Rights Movement. And uh, you're, you're also going to get special members live chats and videos and your comments automatically will come to the top. And so we will increase the likelihood that we can we can see that you're a member that will be able to answer those questions on our show. So if you go on over to YouTube, the Father's Rights Movement's YouTube page, uh, you can click the member button. It's $1.99 a month. Um, and it's, it's something nominal for each and every one of us to be able to do. Uh, but you can think of, of what we would be able to do and the things the father's rights movement would be able to accomplish if just a couple thousand men, uh, became members of that YouTube page, uh, whether it be lobbying efforts, whether it be helping candidates or funding litigation. That's something that uh, here in two weeks, we'll actually talk more about with uh, Ryan McLaughlin will be coming back on to talk about uh, the strategy and what, what exactly is coming down the pipes for the father's rights movement and a class action lawsuit. So that's something you can do, um, give you a little, little inside access and also help us raise some money so that we can we can fund projects and help move um, things forward. So, um, and, and along those lines, I think this is something that uh, I, I kind of chuckle when I saw it. So earlier this week, I logged on to, to LinkedIn and I know I get questions every single week. I know Rosa fields the same questions. Um, how can I get involved? What can I do? Um, how, how do I, how do I make an impact? I may not be able to give any money right now, but what can I personally do? Um, so exactly, I guess one year ago, Tuesday was I reached out on LinkedIn to Casey, um, and ask what I could do. How could I get involved at the time? I wasn't even a practicing attorney. Um, I can say that he did, uh, 
he, he did leave me on red in that uh, conversation. Uh, but then Rosa, I think he's watching right now, uh, picked back up uh, a couple months later and, and got the ball rolling on on what has now become state of the family courts. So um, what, what we'll do tonight is I'll take a little bit of time probably over the next um, half hour or so. And so if you have any questions or anything, let's go ahead and start dropping them in the comments box. I do have a few questions that uh, I had messaged to me this week. And we, I will hop on those to begin with. So go ahead and drop your questions in the comments box, and then uh, we will we will go from there. I'll take this one. So Tyson, why has an unfaltering father's been airing? Um, Nick has been is in the process of moving, so I know there's a lot of moving parts. We've had some guest hosts, different things. So um, in the near future, that's going to get back on a um on a regular schedule but i know that that's what's going on there is he, he's in the process of moving so once he gets all settled in with that we'll be back on the regular schedule so <clears throat> all right so i'm, I'm going to take this one this one um is is something that that i think i get i get a lot from people so what is um and, and the individual's name is john so what is what are your what's your best advice? I'm going into mediation, and I know that my ex will not agree on anything. Okay, so when it comes to mediation, it takes two to tango. There's no way to come to any sort of agreement if both parties aren't aren't there to come to any sort of agreement. And this is kind of where it goes two different ways. So some states and some counties, actually, in California, mediation is what's called CCRC, Child Custody Recommending Counseling. And so that mediation, that mediator, that social worker who's doing that is going to, in turn, based on the mediation, turn around and write a recommendation. Now, that's not necessarily the most common setup, but if your state and your process does that, um, then... You, you need to be aware of this individual is going to be making a recommendation. But uh, the first thing I advise everyone to do going into mediation uh, is you're going to find your non-negotiables. What do you absolutely have to get? What do you absolutely need in this mediation for you to be able to say yes? Because the worst thing you can do is you end up getting stuck up on something that doesn't really matter to you. And then the judge starts making decisions. So if your three things are you want 50-50 custody, you want um, joint medical, you or what, whatever it may be, you go in there and you understand that, hey, if I get these things, this is what I actually wanted. I'm not going to I'm not going to fight or fret over things that really don't matter to me because those things may be on her list of things she absolutely needs. Um if it's gonna, if there's gonna be a recommendation come out of it, there's gonna be a report come out of it. I always tell guys that to start every sentence, you say it's in the best interest of our child for X, Y, and Z to happen because of because of A, B, and C. So I, I tell I tell my clients, you can't say um, it's in the best interest of our child too much. Um, and that number one is it verbalizes you being child centric. And number two is it can help you as a parent in that mediation, maybe stop being as petty and keep you focused on your child. Um, because that, that's, that's going to be the biggest thing. If there's going to be a recommendation based out of that, based off of those conversations and what happens, you're, you're going to want to impress upon that individual that you are focused solely on your child. So it's not about attacking the other party. It's not about doing, it's not about pointing out their flaws. It's about staying about your children and about what is best for them. Um, if it's a situation where they're not making a recommendation, whether it be court ordered mandatory mediation or whether it be, um, whether it be private mediation, um, there are impasses. It happens in, in all negotiations. Uh, so in, in that sense, I usually would want to try to agree on as much as possible, take as much out of the judge's hands as possible, 
and then allow the judge to simply rule on those issues where there are those impasses. Um, that, that a lot of times is going to be more cost effective. If you go to the judge and you have 15 issues and you're dealing with all the, the all the tiny little issues, um, that's going to be more time, more money to navigate through that where maybe you come to them and it's two issues. It's, it's you're, you're, you're arguing over a couple of days, a month of custody, and then what the child support calculation, that's going to be a much more streamlined process. So that, that's kind of my take. I think mediation can be a phenomenal tool, uh, but it, it takes both parties. So Shane here, it's hard for fathers to have any rights here in Australia. It broke me. Um, th this is not an issue that's, that's um, specific to any one part of the world. And that's something that um, I, I know in my time being involved with the father's rights movement, uh, there have been instances where the father's rights movement stepped in on it and helped individuals in the Middle East, um, obviously all over the United States, Canada. Um, and I know right now we're, we're actively looking to grow and expand specifically with our shows uh, in, in Australia, South Africa, Europe, different areas of the world. All right, so we got Tyson's question here. Do you know any judges that have been sued for not recusing themselves? Um, or do you have any good Supreme Court uh, statutes for due process? So in general, judges can't be sued. Uh, pretty much blanket. And we don't want them to be able to be sued. Um, I think that if... It's going to be state specific. So family co family court is state law, and so each state is going to have judicial rules uh, that that judges or or commissioners or whatever you call them in your state on the bench have to follow. So I think if you're having that issue that you've asked for a recusal, um, and they they've denied it, you need to be able to point to th this in our judicial rules. It says this, because you did this, you must recuse yourself or you need to recuse yourself. Uh, because uh, I'll give an example about two weeks ago was in court and a, a woman uh, who her story sounded not unlike many, many men's stories. She hadn't seen her now teenage kids in about three years. And she verbally asked the judge to recuse himself. And the judge said, or asked, are you, are you motioning the court to consider recusal? And she said, yes. And he asked on what grounds? Well, when he asked on what grounds, it was basically because she wasn't getting the results she wanted. And those type of arguments, feelings, feelings don't matter in court. Um, so if you feel like you're getting screwed Okay, you may be. You very well may be. And, and we go back to the start of the show, the sugar cookie reference. Uh, but to get a judge to recuse themselves, you're going to need to provide specific actions and you're going to need to cite very specific reasons as to why that should occur. Now, there are instances, there's been a there's been a big controversy. I forget where the judge is based out of, but they went back over the past, I think, five years and found that he had presided over, I think it was 189 cases in court that he should have recused himself because he had business interest in the case. I believe it was like stock ownership uh, of a company involved in the case. So that definitely does happen. Uh, but you have to be able to effectively communicate the specific reason um, as to why. And I know in family court, uh, there, there may be rules here in California. Once the judge has made an order, so you get one free strike. You, you, you can get rid of a judge prior to the proceeding uh, one time. And then uh, once a judge has made an order, though, you have to motion the court to recuse them. And there has to be good cause. So... Um, suing them, you, you're 99.9% you're .9 sure, sure on that. You're not going to have any luck. So there's not going to be any Supreme Court cases or statutes that allow you to do that. 
but I, I would implore you to dig deeper on what the standard is that they must or what the what rule they must follow. And then how was that rule violated and bring that to the court? We'll take Daniel here. So the reality is the court and court related entities do not care about the best interest of the child. Um, I think that he, here's, here's one thing, I guess I'll get, I'll get on my soapbox. Things have changed. Things are different than they ever have been before. Uh, go talk to any attorney who was practicing 15 years ago and things are very, very different. Now things are moving in the right direction. Um, and so you, I, I see it on a daily basis where, granted, it takes more extreme situations, but I, I can list off half a dozen clients of mine who either have gotten full legal and physical custody or we flipped primary physical custody from mom to dad. So there are some misses um, and there are some judges that make mistakes, but we're moving in the right direction and we are continuing to educate more judges, more attorneys, more parents, and just the general public as to what's truly in the best interest of the children. So um, I, I would say that if you get in front of, say, a judge who I've been in front of judges who say week on, week off is awful. No kid should do week on, week off. Well, we turned around and two weeks later file a brief with all the research that shows that week on, week off is actually a really good arrangement for older kids. So um, that, that would probably be if you're running into things like that. A lot of it has to do with education. And, and sometimes I'll even file those type of briefs to educate opposing counsel. Uh, there, there are attorneys out there. They've been practicing for 20, 25, 30 years. And they still operate as if it's 1985. And in 1985, it was dad gets every other weekend. Deal with it. So there, there are ways you can get around it. And I think uh, the number one is just continuing to educate people. This is a good one. I like this one. So this is from Liz. Okay, so let's get down to reality. For, for the everyday father that has done everything to be a good dad, pays child support, loves his consistent uh, loves his consistent visitation, and never misses time with his child. I'm a licensed case manager, and I have never seen a win for a father, no matter how hard they have tried. Where and who do you think can reverse that stereotype in tiny little or tiny local towns located in the USA? So. I think that the first thing that comes to mind on that is knowing what has occurred in the state of Arkansas. So now I think we're going on about three months now. The law has been, been live and active in the state of Arkansas. We'll probably have Brian back on maybe early next year to talk about any impacts that they're seeing. But all these little towns in Arkansas, they found... So Arkansas, I believe it was six years ago passed a law that there was a preference for joint custody. But they basically found that the courts, the judges were not following that. And in fact, the judicial handbook um, didn't address that, didn't address the change in law. And that actually was one of the key factors that allowed the state of Arkansas to get their 50-50 presumption passed. So I, I generally do agree with you, though. Usually the mom has to screw up to for to see a a dad getting full legal and physical custody or flipping primary custody there usually has to be some screw up and a screw up for a mom has to be much larger than a screw up for a dad to do that so that i, I would definitely agree with that statement anecdotally uh we also have to realize that it's something like 13 14 there are 13 or 14 percent of cases where moms do get the short end of the stick in court so I think to create change, it's educating people, it's sharing videos, it's having conversations, because I think a lot of us did not know how the family courts operated. We did not even know they existed. We just assumed they would be fair. 
until we ended up in family court. So I think having those conversations and talking about what is going on, that that's that's the number one thing. And then I think in terms of creating change, uh, I think that dads have to show uh, that they are more than capable parents. So in what time you do get, maybe it's 40, 60, maybe it's the 25% that every other weekend and one dinner visit gets you. You have to show that you're a good parent because for every, despite the fact that for every five stories we hear about mother or her new love interest harming a child, there's that one incident that involves dad and that dad incident gets amplified. So we, we have to educate people, change the public perception and dads have to do what's best in their time. So I, I'm going to put this up here. So, uh, Ted is Ted's been on the show before. We're, we we got to get you back on Ted. But um, there is a um, there is, he he's citing a Supreme Court case. So uh, Lightkey uh, v United States, nineteen ninety four, uh, is the primary case that lays the constitutional requirement for recusal, um, and then goes into. Um, the fact that that judges do in theory have blanket immunity. So so there's the answer on the the case law in terms of what you can use for your recusal. There's going to be some state specific stuff that goes into that too. But uh, like Key v. United States 1994, that'd be a case I would take a look at. And I'm doing that blind. I have never personally read the case, but I 100% trust, trust Ted. All right, so Daniel, and this is this is a hot topic, um, and and I'm gonna, I'm I'll lay out a little more specifically why things are the way they are. Daniel says I disagree that we should not want to be able to sue judges. Judges are re- rarely had it held accountable under judicial review. So that's a true statement. The legal profession, in general, it's my position that the legal profession in general is one of the few professions that governs itself in totality. So it is lawyers governing lawyers, whether they be judges, justices, attorneys. Um, we're a profession that is is policed by, by our peers. And so that does cause some issues. The problem you would have with judges being sued is you think about how backed up court calendars are now across this country and how underfunded they are. If you throw in the ability for judges to be sued, you're looking at situations where essentially any time a decision goes in another person's way, they throw a lawsuit out there against a judge. Well, it, there wouldn't be a judge in America who wouldn't have active civil cases against them, which would bring our legal system uh, to a screeching halt and make it even worse than it already is. Now, from a family court perspective, what is something we push for in legislation that can create accountability? That's facts, findings, and conclusions of law. So um, there were several states this past year, West Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, Oklahoma, where there were facts, findings, and conclusions of law provisions. So what that means is a judge must lay out the reasoning for their decision. And I actually, without 50-50 being a thing yet in West Virginia, where I know I know the, the crew in West Virginia is gearing up for another run at, this can be really year three of their movement. Um, but they have, if a judge awards a parent less than 35% custody, the ju- there must be a written ruling, including facts, findings, and conclusions of law. So the judge must lay out what they found to be the, the, the facts they based their decision on and why they made the decision they made. And what that's going to do is that is that's going to allow for everyone to understand why judges are making their decisions, make cases more appealable, because right now it's very challenging to appeal a family court case, quite frankly, 
compared to other areas of law, appeals are almost non-existent in family court. I think with facts, findings, and conclusions of law, you're going to see a growth in that. So I think that's the mechanism uh, where we're going to see more accountability is judges having to write down why they made their decisions. Uh, But I, I, I can tell you unequivocally, we do not want to be able to sue judges. Uh, it, it would be a complete mess. Uh, so Adrian, so you can reach me if you go to on, on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram at the father's rights attorney. Uh, you can drop me a message and we can get you the information to be able to contact my office. And that really goes for anyone. So uh, be- best place that you're probably going to get the quickest response, either uh, Facebook or YouTube at the Father's Rights Attorney. I'll pull this. This is this is one that, that I deal with on a on a daily basis. So uh, very few things have changed in SoCal, especially San Diego County. This will not change until the family court services joke of unaccounted. Uh, so in, in I'll, I'll, I don't the into that question a little little jumble, but in California we have something called family court services, and in many counties what family court services does is it acts as a mediator. But if an agreement's not reached, they make a recommendation to the judge. So this social worker uh, makes a recommendation as to what they believe custody and visitation should look like based on a half hour to an hour long conversation with the parties. Different counties, some counties do it a little differently, but in general, most of the counties outside of Orange and LA do the recommendation. And so this recommendation a lot of times turns into the starting point of discussion on what the order is going to be when you do get in front of a judge. Uh, and and it's, it's problematic uh, being, being that I practice in, in count, mainly in counties that have it, but also have cases that, that don't make the recommendation. Um, I I would tend to agree. I mean, I think there needs to be less weight on that recommendation and the judge needs to be the one hearing the arguments and making the decision. Um, But, but I agree. And I think, I think the one thing here in California is there are so many, it's so judge dependent. There are certain judges who I would say the, in general, the younger the judge is, the more progressive they are and the more likely they're going to offer they're gonna. They're going to lean towards some sort of 50-50 arrangement. There are definitely some dinosaurs on the bench that will find any reason at all not to to grant that. And I think think for me, there's a lot of situations where it's frustrating that these come up. A very common one as of late would be like, "Mom doesn't work, Dad does." So. Dad, ha- dad would have to have his wife, fiance, his mom uh, be there to make sure the kids get off to school. And the judge will say, oh, well, the mom can do that. So she'll have all the overnights during the week. So I, I think it's it's so situation dependent. But if you get in front of the wrong judge, that that can uh, that can definitely be the case. So not really a question. So, and recommend minors counsel. So my, my in general opinion is that I don't want any third parties involved. Um, I want to 
minimize the number of people unless the situation specifically deems it necessary. I, it, it's such a crapshoot. It's such a mixed bag, whether they call them minors council, guardians ad litem. Um, it's putting another person in the situation that doesn't need to be there. That's another question mark. It just, it lessens the control and influence of you or you and your attorney, because you're injecting another, you're injecting a third attorney or a third party into the proceedings. Now, some states you can't avoid it, but there are certain states, I believe Missouri is one of them, where if there's allegations of domestic violence, order of a a guardian ad litem is automatic and you can't prevent it. So, but in general, I like to keep third parties out. This is a really good point. This is from Todd. Underfunded with a $55 billion racket, please. Um, well, it's it's reports now or it's north of $60 billion. So, um, but yes, at, at, the, at the state level, at the caseload level for the judges, a lot of times they are, um, a, a lot of times there's too much on their plate. I, I think, for example, even despite the fact that there's a there's a ton of judges, there's a volume of judges in Southern California, they may have 70 to 80 cases and hearings in front of them every single week. And um, there's really, California's tried and I think failed to have a mechanism prior to getting in front of the judge that helps settle cases down. So um, at the state level and what the judges and what the courts have to process and the sheer volume of what they have to process, um, they are understaffed. I'm not going to say underfunded, but they are understaffed. Uh, And there there needs to be a better way to do it. So we got... Let me, let me find this where we're posted. So um, this is, Casey's posted this. So th- this, is an, this is something that the Father's Rights Movement's pursuing to help gain support, raise funding. So U.S. corporations are losing $353 billion uh, a year because of inequality in family court system. Um so that's something that I know there, there's a behind the scenes right now, there's a strong push to get more corporate involvement, um, to educate major employers, major corporations um, of the impact of what family courts doing to their business. Um, so, so on top of the, I guess, tying into there's not enough staff at the courthouses to do what needs to be done. It, it's also hindering uh, business. So we'll go to John here. Many judges are elected and the turnout is very low on those races. Need more coordinated focus on that. Of course, there is legislative accountability through impeachment, but good luck with that. Yeah. Um, especially when you're talking about, uh, low level state court judges, but yes, um, I, I will say that, uh, there are even even in in Southern California where there is, there are just the pop where the population centers are, there are judicial races where judges run unopposed. Uh, in in Riverside County a couple of years ago, I know about half of the judicial races were unopposed. Uh, so that that is something that that we need to be aware of. the The biggest challenge around that would be finding, and there's been some polling work done by some organizations around judges and accountability. And I know uh, the crew in Arkansas and then NPO, they've done some work on judicial initiatives like that. But yeah, that that's something that in a lot of areas of the country, 50 to 100 people in, a, in an off year, like no governor, no senator, no presidential race, like we're talking 50 to 100 people could sway someone who shouldn't be on the bench, but is just 
has has grown roots there can get voted out. So I, I completely agree with that. It's it's something that's hyper local. I know that MPO did some work on it and it, it's very challenging to scale that work. But if you find organizations or you get a coalition of people at the state level together, that's definitely something that can be done. And that's something that other organizations have um, attempted to do. All right. So I live in Brevard County, Florida. How can I find out who is running for father's rights? Uh, so judicially or um, in, in terms of your, your state representatives, I guess I can address both. So the way the NPO did it is they did it. They was hyper locally and they actually got judges to answer questionnaires. Um, or judicial candidates to answer questionnaires um, on the on the rep and outside of that, it, I mean, you can go go to their local political events, ask those questions. Um, I, I know different groups and in different states, they've had some success with state representatives doing that. So yeah, going to those events, or if you live in if you live in a, a community where hey, there's 25 attorneys and two of them are going to be the judges. They're, they're going to be accessible. So a lot of times it just is asking the questions and finding those people or encouraging the people you know that support it to run. At the On the other end of the spectrum, the legislative perspective, um, that's something that like you need to be going to their political events, asking them questions. Get a, I mean, you can get a coalition as small as two or three people in your area to show up at these political events. And this is a... John Nichols out of Michigan actually talked about this strategy and they used it up there. They'll go to political events with a small group of people. We're talking two, three, four people, but they won't sit together. They will sit on different sides of the room and they will all go up to different microphones to ask a version of the same question, essentially putting heat on the person, making it seem like there's a large number of people in the room that are concerned about that issue. So I think that's probably the most effective way. Um, honestly, you can, at the state level, especially your representative assembly people where they're representing 15, 20, 30,000 people, maybe total, just sending their office an email may elicit the response you, you desire. All right, so we have a jurisdictional question here. So how would custody work with father in Texas and children in California? My husband's ex has turned kids against him and now wants to um, and now won't talk to him. 17 and 14 years old, but mom won't allow any contact with them at all and has always been threatening to us. So if there's an open custody case, let's just say it was in Texas, and then they moved to California. If the custody case was opened in Texas, then that same courthouse still has jurisdiction and vice versa. Um, if it was in California originally and dad moved to Texas, it's still going to reside in at that California courthouse. If there's never been a custody case, and this is jurisdictionally being very simple, if there's never been a custody case, it's where the children have resided for the past six months. So in this case, if there's never been a custody case in this situation, then California would be the state and, and where they live would be the county that has jurisdiction and venue over your, um, over your custody case. So if either state's had an open one already, then it goes right back there. If it hasn't, it's where the kids have lived for the last six months. And that's putting, that's being very, very simplistic about it, but kind of get the gist.
go back to Daniel here. This is an interesting one. I'm actually seriously considering appealing my case and taking it to uh, court of appeals. The goal is to challenge the legitimacy of family court services and to collapse that portion of the system. I have an attorney who's been dreaming of this possibility. Um, so yes, and there have been, there ha I, I've seen an increase in the number in the state of California of attorneys who we get FCS reports back and they say, hey, I, let's not do anything. I need to subpoena this um, FCS, this person who wrote this recommendation, because I want to. I want to question them on the stand. Um, so that there have been a couple of different ways, but yeah, in, in general, family court services in a lot of situations gets too much weight. We got Ted here. Don't forget about small and medium sized businesses. I had dinner with a group of Michigan manufacturers who all complained that employees quit after his ex found out where to send child support garnishments. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's something that there needs to be some education on. So I, I, I can't necessarily say the the organization, but we'll say it was a, a rather large organization. And at the local level, it actually involves the state of Michigan. Um, at the local level, there was they actually wanted to support that state's 50-50 bill that's going to get introduced this year. And they actually the at the at the at the local level, the employees agreed and their leadership agreed to support this issue. Um, and Nat, they, they basically sent the initiative up to the national organization and the national organization came down and said, you will unequivocally not be supporting equal and shared parenting as a group. Uh, so I think there, it, it's going to hurt small, medium, large employers, but I think a lot of those employers, just like the general public needs education, uh, the employers are going to need this data presented to them. And they're going to need to be educated on what exactly is going on and what exactly needs to happen. We'll go back to Daniel here because I've seen this. So um, th this is this is an issue with uh, with with family court services. So California and the way they handle domestic violence. Um, essentially, if there's any sniff of potential domestic violence or any allegations, um, FCS. And th this is probably where th this may be. This isn't. This is just a flat out error that probably probably is what's going to be part of the grounds for an appeal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, but uh, they, FCS, if they get any whiff of domestic violence or there's really any allegations whatsoever, will put in that there's a 30-44 presumption and it obviously pushes the court towards a decision. So, yeah. So that's uh, that, that's definitely problematic. So we're going to mark here. How can you ask, get a different judge? Judge I have now is a man hater. Uh, so it depends. So it's going to be a very, it's going to be a state level issue. Each state's going to have their own specific rules. In the state of California, um, one time prior to the judge, to a judge ruling, you can have them removed as the judge. And you can get a new one. And there's no, nothing, nothing bad happens, anything like that. But once that judge has made an order, you have to uh, you have to request they recuse themselves. There usually has to be good cause. So if the judge has already made if, if this was in the state of California and the judge was already making rulings, you would have to have good cause to have them removed. But if they hadn't made any ruling or anything yet, like let's say it's a known judge who 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 never rules on the favor of fathers 
you can strike that judge in California prior to even having a hearing. <clears throat> hey, Ted, um, shoot me, shoot me a DM and I will get you in touch with Ryan. I haven't been, um, I haven't been involved closely with any of the planning. Um, but I know there is, there's a small team right now working on it. And I think they're, they're still in the strategy phase of, of what they're going to do. So, um, one of the things, one of the big initiatives that over the past couple of months, the father's rights movement has stepped to the plate in regards to, and, and what, uh, Ted is talking about is, um, the Father's Rights Movement is going to be funding a class action lawsuit um, that uh, in regards to um, different states' child custody laws. So um, that's something here in two weeks when we have Ryan back on. Um, I, I haven't gotten an update from him. I haven't talked to him in a while other than getting the interview set up for two weeks from now. But um, we'll, we'll have more details. But Ted, just shoot me a, a DM and I can get you connected with him. All right. So we're about 50 minutes in. Let me go through. I'll find a couple more questions here. And on the, uh, on the class action lawsuit side of things, um, if you go to tfrm.org slash donate, um, actually you can go to tfrm.org slash donate, or you can just go to tfrm.org. You can navigate through to the class action page. There's actually, um, a place where you can donate monthly, make a one-time donation to, to help support that cause, uh, because a, a class action lawsuit is, is not cheap. We'll get here with John. So if you, um, off the top of my head, I would have to look. If you're in a state, you're looking for a contact for an attorney. Um, if you if you drop me a DM at, at the Father's Rights Attorney, I do have I do have a pretty robust referral list uh, with with names in most states, not all states, and some of the larger states they may not cover the entire state. But if you drop me a uh, direct message at the father's rights attorney, I will uh, see who I have. Include what city you're in so I can know if, uh, what area of Ohio uh, you would need that help in. So I think this is not not necessarily a question, but I think a story, and I actually talked a little bit about it last week. And it, it goes back to the feeling of fairness. I'm I'm like trying to get my head up over the over the question. So Michael says, I took my ex back to court to enforce physical placement. This semi backfired on me here in Wisconsin. I'm now able to see my child for a few hours on Saturday, which is better than nothing. They tried to force a hair follicle test on me, but not my ex. Long story short, I refused. I'm 100% clean, but I don't see that as fair. I'm issued five hour visits on the second and fourth weekends of the month. Judge told her she has to drive my son to these visits three hours south from where she lives. Um, so one of the things that I, I always advise guys, so there are parts about the system that don't make any sense. There are parts about the system that are not fair. But um, putting it frankly, being an ass just to be an ass, a lot of times backfires on you. Um, candidly, if you were my client and you said, I'm 100% clean, 
and the judge says, you're doing a hair follicle test, but I don't care about her. I would, I would advise you like, let's just do it. It may not feel fair. It may not make sense, but something's clicked in that judge's head. They've made some sort of allegation and sometimes you just have to play their game. That's the, uh, the unfortunate part about the system right now. So going in there and pounding your fist on the, on council's table and telling them about the constitution a lot of times, almost all the time, is not the way to the best outcome in that moment. And I think that there is benefit to the movement of guys being willing to play the unfair game to maximize their time with children. So yeah, it, it's it's not fair. It doesn't make sense, anything. But when... Uh, being principal, how, how principled are we being, I guess, and I'm not directing this at any one person. If we know that decision is going to negatively impact the time we spend with our children, um, I think we have to weigh the kind of cost benefit of that and look at it in a way of, hey, they ordered this. I'm going to get it done. It's going to cost me a little bit of money. It's frustrating, it's annoying, but it's going to allow me in this instance to maximize the time with my children. <clears throat> and then I'll kind of follow up. Like I went in pro se and I think I messed up. Um, I think anybody who goes in pro se not knowing about the situation is you're going to make mistakes. There are certain things that... I can avoid that, that I can help educate clients. Um, I spend a great deal of time educating clients on how to communicate with their co-parent when, um, when they're, they're combative, how to deal with CPS, how to deal with family court services here in California. And there are certain things and I'm in, I'm in front of the same judges over and over again. So there are certain things that I know how to deal with. Um, and what probably the best course of action. Um, in terms of if we we're here in the state of California, I would probably say you file another request for order. You go back in front of the judge. The judge says, oh, you refused a hair follicle test last time and you offer to take it. Uh, because in family court, and I had to, I, I'm not familiar with the laws in California or in Wisconsin, but um, in California family courts, pleading the fifth in regards to anything, essentially the family court judge can presume you're guilty. So you probably, that's probably the, the feeling or the, the answer you elicited from the judge. So, I mean, it, it, they may be willing to do something, they may be able to willing to do something moving forward. You may have to prove a certain burden to get back in front of them, but, um, Sometimes you got to play the unfair game to maximize the time with your child. So it may be going back in front, maybe going and getting that hair follicle test and going back in front of the judge right now. Um, so you go in there proactively with a hair follicle test. And then if they say, go get another one, you go get another one. <clears throat> so we'll get, this will be the last uh, question here. Um, so is there such a thing as motion to compel the other parent to file the court order after she violates it for nine straight years with strong evidence? Um, so is there, it depends on the state. So number one is like state like Oklahoma. If you go back, um, I think it was two, three weeks ago, I had Keith Flynn and Brian Jackson on if you go to my YouTube page, you can probably find the specific video that just has that part of the conversation. But in the state of Oklahoma, there is a there is a form that can be filed that gets you in front of the judge within 21 days. Um, it's different. So you're in the state of California. So um, we'll, we'll see. I'm seeing your other comment here. So it depends on your state. Some states have that fast track. Other states... You you would you just need to file a request for order so you can file for contempt, um, which isn't going to get you any more parenting time. It's going to be a punishment for them. 
Um, but you can file a request for order and go in front of the judge requesting to modify on the basis that the other parent's not following. Candidly, the biggest challenge you're going to have is that it's been nine years. Uh, so at some point in time, the judge is going to take a look at it and say, you allowed this to happen for nine years before you've done anything about it. So you better have a good answer for that. That's probably going to be one of the questions the judge asks. But in the state of California, uh, FL 300 request for order um, to modify custody and visitation on the basis of um, on the basis of the other parents not following the order. So we'll take we'll take one more here. We're right at the one hour mark. Um, so we'll take Mark's question here. In criminal court, they will appoint a defense attorney if you don't have any money. Is that something that can be done in family court? No, um, family court is pseudo civil. And so there's no, no guarantee of right to counsel. So, um, that, that unfortunately there are some groups, there are mechanisms. They're, they're a little bit tougher to come by, but in general, I mean, in family court statistics say 80 to 90% of men are unrepresented in family court. So, the, the best piece of advice I can give you in that is to, there's plenty of education available online. Do your research, understand what's going on, get a gist for what's going on, and then be able to go from there. But given that it's not uh, criminal, there's no, um, it, it's, I, I hate even saying this, but it, it, essentially the rights that are at stake in family court are deemed to not rise to the level of criminal court where you can lose in some states life or um, your freedom where you you can get that public defender it does it that's not the case in family court um, so and unfortunately the short answer is no um, but there are resources out there whether it be educating yourself or um, limited scope where they come in and do certain things it, it really depends on your situation so, all right, guys, so we've spent about an, or an hour and two minutes now, um, so we'll get off here for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, everyone that participated. Uh, next week, we will be back. We will have North Carolina attorney Ashley Nicole Russell on the show, um, and then the following week, we'll have uh, Minnesota attorney Ryan McLaughlin on again. So thank you, everyone, and I will see you guys next Thursday.